Yeah, so uh, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to speak with you today. And this is a workshop on connected autonomy. And I'm going to talk about coding uh, for connected autonomous systems. So amazing autonomous systems are being built uh, both in uh, academia and in the industry. And if you are uh, to go with uh, popular culture depictions of how these systems are built, you might be inspired to believe that a robot army is about to be created. And uh, not just that, they're probably going to be created by a very small number of people, maybe an evil genius scientist. But in reality, the situation is, uh, for better or for worse, a little bit different. Uh, an army of humans are needed to uh, build even a single uh, reliable, uh, remotely reliable robot. And in fact, you may have heard this word on the street that you need six years to get a PhD in robotics because uh, you can only get one minute of usable footage per year. Uh, so where does most of this effort go? Uh, so my colleague at Illinois, Chris Hauser, uh, sums it up as such. Uh, robotics is really the art of debugging, okay? So in fact, programming anything is 80% debugging. This is well known. And robotics is no different. So I'm interested in this question of uh, how can we build tools and uh, maybe mathematically or algorithmically oriented tools that can reduce the uh, amount of effort needed uh, for robotics and uh, maybe balance the scales a little bit. Okay. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about some recent work we have been developing uh, uh, on building tools for programming and debugging robotic systems. Uh, and there's going to be two parts to this talk. Initially, I'll describe the problem and uh, the approach that we are taking and some of the things that you can do with this uh, programming system. And in the second part, I'm going to take a slightly deeper dive and talk about uh, uh, the math behind the programming language design and how you can use uh, this language to do analysis. All right, so to start with, let's think about coding a simple application. You have a fleet of robots and you have a fixed or streaming sequence of waypoints and you're trying to write some code for these robots and the goal is very simple. Each of these robots should get to a waypoint and every waypoint should be visited exactly once and the robot should not collide. Okay, so we call it the delivery application but you can imagine that instead of uh, visiting the waypoints if you change it to taking a picture or mapping uh, are delivering a package. This is an archetype of an application that will show up in uh, warehouse management, surveillance, agriculture, all kinds of different uh, scenarios. So uh, how can you develop code for this application? In fact, let's take a step back. How would you write the pseudocode for this application? Well, you can start with two big steps. You have to assign these targets or waypoints to these robots. And then the robots have to go to this target, to the assigned target. Now let's look into the assignment step. Uh, well, there are multiple robots and they have to go to one waypoint and not collide with each other. So you need some sort of a shared memory or some shared information between them. Uh, and if you are going to have a shared table, for example, which maintains the list of all the tasks and the ones that have been assigned, you can also use other ways. Uh, you can also find other uses of the table. For example, uh, you could maintain all the paths that the robots are going to take, and then you can avoid uh, collisions or congestion of uh, robots going into one part of the space uh, altogether. Right. Okay, so the high level thing you need for this assignment to work is some sort of a shared uh, information or a shared table. And the second thing you need is for the robots to be able to uh, plan paths and track these paths. Okay, okay so uh, sort of summarizing this uh, pseudocode for uh, our purposes, we identified that there are several blocks that are needed. You need a notion of shared memory uh, and you need uh, some sort of a planning algorithm for the robots to actually follow paths. And finally, you need a controller for each of these robots to track the waypoints in that path. 
Now, if you look at this a little bit closely, each of these three or four problems that we have identified uh, are hard problems and they've been tackled for more than three decades uh, by different communities. Distributed computing people have worked on mutual exclusion and shared memory. Uh, path planning is a you know, central problem in robotics, control similarly. And so from the point of view of a robotics programmer, each of these things might look like a rabbit hole. And before you know it, when you're trying to put these things together, you are going bug hunting into each of these rabbit holes. So is it possible to create abstractions or building blocks so that the programmer can just use these building blocks to create this flowchart and go, go from pseudocode to code very quickly? Is that a pipe dream? Is it possible uh, to have such abstractions? Well, um, actually, the, such good abstractions exist, right? So a uh, great example would be x86, the assembly language of the instruction set that specifies how high-level application programs talk to hardware. For example, within the x86 uh, assembly language, there is the add instruction, right? The add instruction says, how it gets to uh, data from memory and those uh, values from memory are added and stored in a particular position in the register within the CPU, okay? So that's all that the add instruction specifies. It's important to note what it doesn't specify. For example, it doesn't say how each of those steps that I mentioned are implemented in transistor. So that's the value of an abstraction to clearly say what a particular instruction or particular building block should do, but doesn't go and specify how it needs to be done. And this is good because it separates concerns. Uh, so for example, semiconductor companies like Intel and AMD can go ahead and implement those micro steps in transistors and they can make all kinds of sophisticated decisions about algorithms, usage of area, layout, transistors, et cetera. And uh, software companies like Google, Microsoft, et cetera, they can build compilers and interpreters and operating systems uh, which enable us to write programs which can be compiled down to those uh, assembly language instructions. And this really enables uh, expressiveness and portability. And in the, in the case of x86, this is what has uh, allowed the computing ecosystem to blossom. Different groups of people, even competitors, can talk to each other and share information because they talk this common lingua franca, which is the x86 assembly language at some level. Uh, in robotics, the situation is uh, not quite like that. Um, uh, so it's, it's more like, uh, you know, this USB cables we used to carry around. Every device needs its own power adapter and nothing quite talks to each other. So even if you can uh, develop the code for one robot uh, painstakingly solving or uh, developing the implementations for each of these building blocks like path planner and controller, uh, and it's completely hopeless that this would translate to another robot, okay, without sort of starting from scratch and doing everything all over again. So uh, that's the problem at the center of this project that uh, we have been working on. We are designing a uh, programming system called Quad that allows, um, uh, that bakes in some of these abstractions that we have been talking about into the language. And as side effect, it allows portability and verifiability of the code. So I'm going to show you some examples pretty quickly, and then uh, we'll talk about some of the benefits we get from this language. So here is, for example, the code for the uh, delivery application I talked about at the beginning. So uh, I don't want to go through this in detail, but you notice there are two big events uh, that are specified, one for the assignment part, which uses this shared memory to do the assignment of tasks. And then there is another event which is uh, triggered when a robot reaches a target. Now, the thing I want to draw your attention to is that um, the abstractions that this language uh, uh, has allows the robots to have shared memory. 
for example, uh, there is a list here, which is a shared list across all the robots, which has all the tasks, including which task has been assigned to which robot, okay? There is an abstraction of sensor ports, uh, for example, the position of the robot, right? So each robot has access to its position. But the language does not specify how, for example, this position is implemented, right? So a robot could get its position from GPS, from indoor localization systems, SLAM, what have you, doesn't matter. From the point of view of the language, it is just a point in 3D space, or maybe uh, you can have the angles as well, but you get to use the position without worrying about how it is implemented. Similarly, for the shared variable, uh, you get a shared table that all the robots can read and write to. And how exactly that is implemented on top of message passing, TCP, IP, Wi-Fi, uh, the programmer doesn't have to worry about it, okay? Uh, so this is the delivery app and, uh, okay, so we have this language, what can you do with it? It looks nice, it's short, 45 lines of code. Um, well, for starters, you can compile this language and when you compile, for the language to be executable, of course, you have to uh, have the libraries and the actual implementations of the path planner and the positioning system, et cetera. So let's say you want to deploy this language on a car. So uh, together with the cord code that I showed you in the previous slide, you would need the library implementing the controller for the car or the library implementing the positioning system for whatever the car has. And once you compile those things together, the quad compiler will generate executable code, uh, which can then be deployed on the car and you can execute it. The car can run and do the delivery task. Similarly, let's say you want to deploy the same application on a drone then uh, the code for the application remains the same, but now you have to compile it with the library for the drone because it has a different uh, controller. And you get the code for the drone and you can deploy it on the drone. So that's the first benefit. And then you can advance this and apply it to other uh, hardware platforms uh, by writing these libraries. And every time you write a library, uh, it's, it's work, it uh, takes some development, but then you can use it on uh, multiple robots or with the same platform. Now, the other thing you can do is you can also simulate the code. So the same application code you can actually deploy it in our simulator that we have developed for this language. Now to simulate a robot, you, you don't have the hardware, so you have to uh, harness the code with some model of the robot, okay? So uh, we have these models of these cars and the drones in uh, simulator, and you can then deploy many copies of, uh, of this application on different uh, different cars and drones. And the simulator is a quick way to debug the system so you can deploy it in large scale, let it run overnight and see if something goes wrong. And the last thing you can do is uh, verification. And this is something I'll get into in the last part of the talk. Um, you can look at mathematical models of these vehicles, not just for simulation. And then you can combine that with the code and um, bring to bear the advances that have made, been made in the last uh, you know, three decades of research in formal verification, including hybrid systems. I heard reachability being mentioned earlier. Uh, so all of these things can be uh, brought to bear on, on the problem of checking whether the uh, code that got generated uh, meets the properties that you care about. Okay, so we'll get into that a little bit in the second half. So uh, here are some examples uh, that delivery application uh, being deployed in our simulator. Oh. Video is why it's not playing. Because the play button is hidden. All right. Yeah, it's uh, it's. Um, running that delivery application in this uh, environment, warehouse-like environment. So the red uh, 
targets are the ones that are assigned and the green ones that have been completed. And what the change of a single um, configuration file, you can deploy it on different scenarios with different number of robots. So here is a simpler scenario where we have three vehicles and five drones, and the same application is running. And the simulator itself is actually quite uh, detailed, right? So for example, each vehicle is running three or four different threads one for executing the events, one for updating the sensors, one for running the local controller, messaging, et cetera. So if you're running a simulation with say 15 or so agents like over here, uh, very quickly uh, the simulator is going to spawn hundreds of threads and the simulator is engineered in a way that it can sort of scale to uh, that level. Now, you can take the same code, as I said, compile it with the libraries for um, the actual hardware and deploy it on the real system. And so this is a video from our intelligent robotics lab at Illinois, where the same application has been deployed on uh, two drones and a couple of these uh, ground vehicles. Uh, most of you are familiar with this. These are the uh, F-110th vehicle models that are being used for education and research. They have a LIDAR and the, and the drones are these uh, things that uh, we have built in our labs, uh, not, nothing particularly remarkable about them, standard drones. They have a positioning system using Vicon that they are using. Let me show you another uh, cool application. So uh, drone shows are becoming uh, popular for entertainment, uh, formation flights. And uh, most of you would know that uh, the core algorithms that are used are actually quite simple, right? So the extremal robots move according to some script that's designed by the artists, but then uh, the interior robots are doing something like a distributed consensus, a very simple averaging kind of calculation to move to the center of their neighbors, right? So if you look at a textbook, for example, Magnus Egerstad's textbook has many algorithms like these where you're running a consensus protocol uh, to do certain type of formation. And it's so simple, like two, three lines in math. And now uh, you can write that in quad, which will also be uh, quite, uh, quite succinct. Uh, so if you look at the core of this code, it's really two lines. If you're not an extremal agent, then go to the center of your neighbors, okay? And this is possible because we have this shared memory abstraction. So each robot can look at the position of all the other robots, including their neighbors. And uh, the, the language allows shared memory, uh, which is then implemented in the runtime system using messages, but the result is the code is uh, very succinct and almost uh, close to this uh, mathematical uh, model. And then again, you can deploy this on uh, the simulator. So this is uh, that formation application running on a bunch of drones. Okay, I'm going to move from this. Um, the third one is a more complicated application. This is uh, mapping. Uh, this required us to create a library for the sen LIDAR sensor. Um, this uh, LIDAR gives you a bunch of points and the points are timestamped. And uh, once we have the library for the LIDAR sensor, then uh, actual application is again, uh, you know, 40, 50 lines of code, and you can have a distributed version of this where the robots are sharing their local maps that they have created. Uh, and uh, then you can have a distributed mapping application where they shared the map to create a global map uh, with the shared information. 
Uh, and this application, for example, was written by a master's student in like two weeks uh, with almost no training on the language uh, before starting the project. And the last one I wanted to mention is a project that I'm very excited about. This is new and actually led by uh, Katie here. Uh, this is a trying to deploy Quad on uh, agricultural robots. Um, uh, these robots are built by uh, Professor Girish Chowdhury's lab They're called TerraSentia. They have LiDAR positioning system. And uh, they're already able to do pretty impressive things like track uh, corn rows take pictures. Uh, and our goal in this new NRI project is to deploy it on uh, deploy quad based applications on distributed uh, fleets of such robots and also make the programming part a lot easier and monitoring possible uh, for when something goes awry with this uh, with these agricultural robots. Okay, so um, with that, let me now transition and talk a little bit about uh, the underlying math that allows us to reason about correctness of these, uh, these applications written in Quad. So of course the goal is to uh, mathematically prove that the code satisfies some requirements. Um, so, uh, and this is useful not just for debugging but also to generate uh, artifacts that can serve for certification purposes, like for uh, agencies like FAA. So uh, the high level verification problem is um, you want to uh, take in as input the program and a requirement. So in this case, the requirement could be that the robots do not collide and either come up with a proof that the system satisfies the requirement or come up with a counter example that shows that the requirement is violated. Now, the system we are dealing with is very complicated, right? So there's a robot which has its own physics, there is code. In fact, this is a distributed system because there are multiple robots. Uh, so just to give you a very high level view of how reasoning can work and proofs can work here, uh, let me sort of draw an analogy with proving something uh, for something simpler, okay? so. Let's talk about reasoning about a block falling down an inclined plane. And just enumerate the stack of knowledge uh, that has to go into proving something about this block, right? We want to, let's say, check that the velocity when the block hits the ground is not too high or something. Now, there is, of course, the model itself, the block, the inclined plane, et cetera. To solve this problem, you probably begin by doing a force balancing, meaning you have to figure out what are the forces that are imbalanced in each of the different cardinal directions. And that would then give you acceleration with which you can get to calculate velocities. And that step of uh, calculating acceleration, you're invoking Newton's laws of motion. Uh, if there are multiple blocks and they were colliding, you would be using Newton's third law of motion. But Newton's laws themselves are built on top of calculus. So the language of integration, differentiation, taking inverses. Uh, and on top, uh, if you want to automate this whole process of reasoning, uh, you want to build these rules into a tool like let's say MATLAB. So this stack is sort of well understood and uh, we use this often in undergraduate level education, often not uh, uh, making them explicit, but we want to build a similar stack for uh, reasoning about robotic systems and we want to have similar levels of automation. So the model in this case will be our car with the program, the quad program. And uh, we need techniques like force balancing to reason about this program. And this is where we have you know, 30 years of research on reasoning about hybrid systems, uh, inductive invariants, barrier certificates, uh, these types of techniques will have to be encoded in our uh, verification framework. And uh, this is the part that I wanted to draw your attention to. So uh, Newton's laws of motion will now have to be augmented with also the laws of this programming language or the semantics of the programming language. 
And then underneath we'll have to add you know, logic to calculus. So let me tell you about what the laws of this programming language look like and how they get uh, formalized in math. So the starting point is always syntax, right? What are the valid sentences you can write in this language? And this can be generated from the syntax of the language. Then we have to define what is the state of the system. Ultimately, we want to prove properties about the state. So in this case, the state will include the physical, the software, and the hardware state of each robot. But then there is more. We have to combine or stack together state, the states of all of these robots to get the state of the system uh, configuration. And then the semantics of the programming language, or what I called the chord laws earlier, basically define how this configuration, the system level state is evolving over time uh, or over steps of the program. So this is really what is encoded in the semantics of the language. Okay, so I want to, uh, so how am I doing on time? Is it five minutes or so or a little more? About 10 minutes still. Ah, okay, great. Uh, yeah, I paused my PowerPoint in between and that sort of uh, ruined my clock on the PowerPoint. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, right. So the way the, the evolution of uh, the program is defined when we um, define the, uh, the semantics of the programming language is like this. So basically, um, we are going to write down a function. This is what is written um, as the arrow over here that defines uh, how a current state of the system, which includes a global state and the state of the robot and the current statement that is getting executed by the robot gets transformed into the new state, okay? And this little script P here says that it's going to be a power set because the system is non-deterministic. So from a single state, you could be going to multiple states uh, you don't have control over the order in which events are occurring in the different programs. There are timing delays, etc. So a function like this defines how the program is evolving uh, and the way it is written in the language, uh, in, in the parlance of programming languages is in terms of a bunch of rewriting rules. And for example, a simple statement like X equals V. So this is assigning a variable x, the value v, right? So the interpretation of that statement will be a rewriting rule, which looks like uh, this statement over here. Uh, so the way to read this rewriting rule is uh, the condition above the line is the precondition. So if x is a global variable, then uh, the condition under the line has to be executed or that's the rewriting rule that will change the state of the system, okay? So in this case, the state changes by leaving everything identical except the value of the variable X in the uh, global memory and in the local memory gets updated with the value V which was the thing that we were trying to assign in the first place, right? So that was a single step in the statement of the programming language, which updates the system's configuration like this. Okay, so basically this has to be done for every possible statement in the language, and it can start to become complicated, uh, particularly because this is a distributed and concurrent system. And also, uh, there is the environment, right? So when the robots actually are uh, running, they're, they're moving in space and that movement also influences the system's configuration and that has to be encoded in some of these rules. And the tack we take in this language design is we encode the physics in terms of a function and this could be a closed form function. It's a nice function if you have nice models of the system or you, if you want to uh, reason about nice models of the system, or it could be a black box function, right? It could be just a simulator and you just execute this function without really knowing uh, what is the analytical form of that function. 
Okay. So now I'm going to ask you to do a little bit of a mental jujitsu. Okay. So uh, these rules define the semantics of the language, and you can write it down on a piece of paper. Uh, but we encode the semantics of the language in this framework called K. So let me tell you about K. So K is a framework developed by Grigore Rosu over the last 10 years at uh, Illinois. And what it allows you to do is to define semantics of programming languages in this form uh, in a software. And then K can generate an interpreter for that language, okay? Now, why do you care about an interpreter of this language? You could just compile the language and run it and simulate it, right? But K can do more for you. So with this interpreter that K generates, you can execute the programs symbolically, okay? Meaning uh, you don't have to put down numerical values of where the robots are initially. You can just say, let's take X naught and execute the program symbolically with that symbolic variable X naught. And uh, you know, K has been very successful. It has been used to give formal semantics for um, C, Java, uh, the latest Ethereum virtual machine. Uh, it has really had a big impact in finding uh, concurrency and security bugs in C, for example. Uh, so we have formalized Quad in K and that allows us to do symbolic executions of these Quad programs. So how does uh, verification work? Well, let's say uh, you are trying to prove this property that robots do not collide when they're running this delivery application that I showed you earlier. So that's our code here, the delivery application. And phi here is the property that we are trying to prove. So you would write down in a formula that robots do not collide. The positions are far apart enough. And then to prove this property, you would want to check that P is indeed preserved by all possible statements in that quad program, okay? And that it is also preserved when the robots actually move, right? Uh, so that's the last part. And the way the quad semantics in K is set up, you can decompose that proof into two separate parts. Uh, the first part would reason about the program. So the code that I showed you, 45 lines doing events and shared variables, all of that could be checked using um, the symbolic execution engine of K I mentioned in the previous slide. And the second part, which is checking whether the physics of the robot also preserves uh, the invariance that you care about, that is where we have to invoke the research from the hybrid systems community. We can do reachability analysis. We can do barrier certificates, what have you, uh, but we can farm it out to this huge amount of technology that exists already. So in this particular work, we use a tool called DriveVR that came from our group, but you could use any other tool. Uh, so for example, what DriveVR does is uh, for specific initial sets, it can propagate the reach tubes. Even if you don't know the model, it can do that in a stochastic sense. And then you can check whether the reach tubes uh, hit the unsafe set or not. Uh, if it does, then you can uh, think of that as a uh, uh, suggestion for a bug and uh, you can go and investigate that more closely. So we bring this all together in this verification system and we are able to check properties of these application uh, on uh, you know, reasonable numbers of robots in reasonable amounts of time. In some cases, we are not able to prove safety and those, those cases are the ones that suggest that there is some problem with the controller and it requires a closer uh, look at the overall system. So, um, so I think uh, the conclusion or the takeaways from this uh, talk would be that it is possible to have portable and expressive abstractions for uh, coordinating robots. And we haven't yet done a user study that would make us help us make an ironclad claim about productivity, but from the uh, examples that we have seen so far, it seems to help uh, productivity. Uh, of uh, 
at least students that are trying to build uh, applications for multi-robot systems. Uh, the abstractions that are separating the concerns from the physics and control side and the distributed coordination side uh, not only help productivity, but they also help verification because they separate the two proofs and different kinds of tools can be applied to uh, these uh, different uh, sources of challenge. So uh, if you are interested in this, we'll be very happy to talk more. Um, you can try out Quad. all the software is open source. Uh, if you're really interested, you can write some new applications using Quad. Uh, ultimately, the success of a programming language depends on the community of users and the libraries that get built for that uh, framework. Uh, and so hopefully we can develop more libraries for other types of uh, mobile robotic systems. Uh, we are working with, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Katie and Girish Chaudhary's group on deploying it on these agricultural robots. And then I think there are very interesting questions to be asked about the abstractions themselves. Um, so, so far what I've talked about are abstractions dealing with um, uncertainty in this worst case sense, like, uh, position uncertainty and things like that. As we start to work with more complicated sensors like these LIDARs and cameras, we will need abstractions that take into account uh, approximations and probabilities as well. Uh, and so that's another direction, how we can bring uh, stochastic abstractions into the fold of the programming language. And then the analysis tools will also have to deal with uh, stochasticity and probabilities, but there's a lot of work on probabilistic programming, which can be then used to fill in the, the, uh, the part where we need a mechanical analysis. Okay, so with that, I'll stop. Um, the students um, uh, who did the, most of the work, I want to identify and recognize them. So Ritika Ghosh here um, is the leading student. She just graduated. Uh, Chiao is a current a senior PhD student. Sasha Mishailovic is a, a faculty in the computer science department and worked very closely with him on this. And also Professor Gia Dollarud. Uh, you've had wonderful experience engaging with the local community, yeah, startups, uh, hobbyists, as well as uh, uh, students. Yeah, and this is the uh, overall team. Uh, yeah, so thank you. I'll be very happy to take questions.